you. Uh, this is called April Again, and I Don't Know. It's April again, and I don't know about it being crueler than any other month. But the terror of things is certainly in full swing. And despite it being the 21st century, and despite the advances of science and civilization and the rest of it, on any given day, you'll still see bloated bodies tossed into shallow graves like the garbage they are, as rusted tanks trungle through whatever's left of somebody's hometown. Just like it were 1943 or 1912 or 1972. And I'm not trying to get political, I'm just thinking out loud, putting down the obvious in my ragged little book like always, because it still seems to help a bit when nothing else does on a Tuesday afternoon in April, when I'm tired of work and life and love and death and everything else they're selling on those big green televisions above the bar. Very nice. to the Socially Yet Distanced Pod Collective Hour. And tonight we're going to be talking with William Taylor Jr. Um, about his poetry, his world, and a little bit how he and I got to know each other, uh, philosophies. And if you're not careful by the end of the um, by the end of the episode, you may have all of the world's problems solved. So <laughs> hang tight and we're going to sit and talk with Bill. Uh, Mr. Taylor, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me. Well, we're more than here. happy to have you and uh, really excited. I, You know, our history is one that's a little bit convoluted in that, um, like I ran across some stuff today and trying to do a little bit more research that where you and I have been trading or, or I know what it was. We both got pu published in The, the one from England with um, Chris was the guy originally and his sister. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever yeah. That, that rag was. Right. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was friends with them and actually got published with them. That was one of the first places ever that okay. I had anything ever published. Gotcha. I just laughed my head off that you and I both had been there because <laughs> we are also probably the only two that remember it. <laughs> right. Though I still can't think of the name of it right now. I but. can't either. I, and, <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> but, yeah, so. But, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, so, you know, William and I have known each other for at least since 2010, 2011, and been in the same circles, but we haven't necessarily met and spent time together or even knew each other. Um, you know, I took a hiatus from some of the socials. And everybody just kept writing and, you know, re-entering back into that world. Um, it was a great pleasure to see people like Mr. Taylor um, still writing and still doing um, what originally attracted me in a much, much better and much, much mature way. And that's you, Mr. William Taylor. <laughs> um, and I, I appreciate having you around. I appreciate being able to access your words. And, you know, uh, you give me clout, brother. I appreciate you. Being <laughs> Happy to do what I can. Well, tell us, tell us a little about, you know, we, we got some time stamps in places, but tell me really what that journey was like for you. Oh, um, as far as writing in general, um, I guess some sirens are going by here. Um, <clears throat> 
You know, uh, I first started getting turned on to poetry in uh, late high school, senior year, uh, college. I took a few courses, uh, English literature and such. I kind of fell in love with uh, the romantics, first of all, you know, Keats and Shelley and um, Byron. And that got me excited about things. And um then later on, I remember Thomas Hardy was like the first poet that really spoke to me in a way that he wrote about life in this kind of darker way that they didn't teach you about that much in school. You know, right. he said these things that you didn't hear that often, like his this kind of what a lot of people would call this pessimistic view of life and the universe. And that really spoke to me because I always felt those things, but you never heard anyone talking about them, you yeah. know. And so he was one of those first writers, both his poetry and his novels, like uh, Tess of the Durbervilles and Jude the Obscure, these really dark novels that really spoke to me. And I never read any writing like that before that kind of really talked about life and the universe in the way that made sense to me. Right. And so, that you know, he was one of the first writers that really kind of got me going. Um, How old were you at that point? Um, You know late teens 20 ish you know um, i, I yeah. tell you why i asked that because you know social yet distance really kind of rose out of a conversation i've had with fran Locke, uh who is if you don't know her bill i'll send you some links she is yeah the best poet i know okay the name's familiar but i don't know if i'm familiar with her work really. well she's around but you, she doesn't use her name in most places oh, okay um, but I've got a bunch of her poetry, so I'll send you a, a shitload. But she, she's she been my best friend for a long, long time. And she lives in London. She's um, Irish um, of gypsy blood, old school, um, and fought all of her barriers to become what she is now a PhD of poetry at Cambridge. <laughs> wow. Which, it's not a, a life thing for her because she hates ac academia, but... <laughs> right. Oh, wait, did I say that out loud? Uh, <laughs> but our initial... We've had a conversation for 10 years now about the differences between the education system there in the UK and the way that it was here. And, you know, I'm... Georgia bred and born. My elementary school was tainted with, you know, racism and um, slavery. And that was the history that they taught me in my classes. Right. And it was, I always saw through that and I knew better. And I really wasn't in those communities at all. Right. Because I rejected that from the word go. I mean, my mom had a crush on little Richard, you know, and, <laughs> and and um, Johnny Mathis, my God, she would have run away with him. So, you know, I, I, was, like taught, I was taught from the very, very young age because she was ridiculed for that kind of stuff. So, right. Um, it, it was just, you know, we saw, I know what the, what most people in the U.S. are taught and it's your standard stuff. They're not getting any kind of outsider poetry. They may right. get the, the le, more liturgical, li, literature based stuff like you're talking about, um, you know, the, all the all the French, um, I mean, all the French poets, all the e English poets, right. know, really need a dictionary to read them and understand them and speak a language from two centuries ago. Well, in Fran's case, she could do that and tell you all the real history that goes behind it. You know, from the poetry, right. you know, from the poetry that she's read all her life, right? The stories that her Irish family told her, or whatever the case might be. Whereas I'm sitting in class getting what I got. I'm sure what you got was different based on where you were, and I just feel like we shortchanged ourselves out of that. And that it, people like you and I who read, and I want to talk about your books and all that stuff too, but. You know, people like us who read and actually strive to go for education are put in a box and it's like, we're the yeah. winner, you know? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, um, you know, I grew up in Bakersfield, California, which is very conservative. And uh, my high school was, was South High and our um, uh, mascot or whatever was Johnny Rebel. And literally, you know, there was a big Confederate flag. Oh, you know, I know Johnny up, Rebel very, yeah, very clearly. Yeah, like up through, you know, I don't know when they, when they, you know, stopped having Johnny Rebel with the Confederate flag as our mascot. But, you know, when I was going to high school in the 80s, that was, you know. Dude, we had a governor when I was a kid that sold, fr had a fried chicken store, had all black people that worked for him, was a, a pronounced racist, um, so what they called the inward knockers in a case <laughs> and a black guy would have to sell them to you. All right. Like, you know, that kind of shit. A town right outside of Atlanta where I was living, the law was you had to carry a gun. Wow. You could not live in that city north of Atlanta without carrying a gun. It's right. very strange. <laughs> you know, it's very strange. strange. <laughs> Where do people get so far away from humanity? And that's right. You know, I mean, I've been there away from humanity, um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I, I've lived in California all my life, and once I moved out of Bakersfield, and I was about twenty-five, I've lived in very liberal places in California. Right. So sometimes when I've gone to like a few places in the Midwest where guns are a big thing it's always very weird to me just to see random people walking down the street with guns yeah you know, it's very surreal it's very odd well and just my automatic response in my head is why right exactly <laughs> every time i see one it's like what is, what what are you doing <laughs> you know they want to preach jesus to you and all they're doing is living in fear which is what jesus says don't do <laughs> right yeah no, what's that, number that, one do not kill you gotta <laughs> gotta be strapped i don't think jesus said that yeah no it's it's never made any sense to me it's uh yeah me either um but that's where you know so, social yeah distance came from was is like i noticed you know there's all these dissimilar events when the true knowledge is really kind of you know available to you if you'll go and look for it the sad thing is they don't make it available you know right at least yeah. at least when she was growing up and you know across the water she was having to deal with her own personal issues but she had access to libraries that had books to, you know back right in the exactly yeah it's, we're kind of getting into a scary time now where you know they're really working harder at banning banning books and stuff and you know back you know and when i was growing up they didn't necessarily teach everything, but they didn't right. ban it. You could still go to the library and, you know, find it, you know. Right. And you would be like they were hiding it. Community from standards would dictate whatever was right. in that library. It, it was very simple. I lived in DeKalb County. So when I went to a DeKalb County library and whatever the school board decided needed to be in those libraries, they put in the library. Right. Lots of cowboys and Indians and <laughs> little black sambos, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's it's so weird to look back on that and say, man, you, indoctrination is for real, dude, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I just am so glad that I didn't really succumb to that. I was one of three white kids in an all-black school. <laughs> I was in and out of jail my whole life, you know. I. Yeah. I have no problems with race or, or color or anything. I, I right. lived through. I have lived through making relationships with people who are people and not giving a shit about what kind of people they are. Right. And you know, yeah. people and you get to you get to find out what they're about. You know, that's the joy of life to me. Right. So let's talk about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I I just went to my therapist too. Damn it. Um, <laughs> um, I know you know. There's some backlog of your history as well. Um, do you have any older poems that you'd like to share that um, somebody sure. needs to? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that. So I well, I was gonna say I first started sending stuff out probably in the early to mid '90s. You know, I think I told myself 
when I had what I thought to be a hundred good poems, I'd start sending stuff out. And I was still living in Bakersfield. And when I first started, uh, you know, this was before you sent stuff out on the internet, you know, you'd put stuff in an envelope and you'd mail it to a right. limousine somewhere, you know, and I would go to LA, which was the closest place that had any culture, a couple hours away from Bakersfield. And then I just pick up little punk rock zines, you know, and goth zines and literary zines. And then I bring them home and I'd submit to them. Drew and, blood, drew blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I can read a couple old ones. Um, this is from uh, Words for Songs Never Written, which um, I think it's kind of hard to find right now, but it's a collection of kind of all my early chat books and uh, some other stuff from the 90s and early 2000s um i'm just gonna pick one at random let's see all right it's called the faces and the voices and the rest of it i wake up and call in sick to work because some days the faces and the voices and the rest of it are just a bit too much to face and time is needed just to stare at walls or get righteously drunk do nothing at all, which seems to be a dying art and a dying world. Sunday afternoon, and I walk along Geary Boulevard until I find a bar that has no name. It's just a doorway into a darkened little room, an escape hatch from the day. And I duck in there, and the bartender is kind. I order a beer, and she gives me that and a shot of something on the house. And I look up at the television screen and see the city of New Orleans underwater. And a voice says, hey, Elvis. And I turn my head and at the end of a bar, the blonde woman old enough to be my mother flashes her tits. I smile weakly and buy her a beer, glad to have found a new place to hide. Yeah, nice stuff. You know what I like is, is it's weird. That's kind of weird because, you know, I think about reading your words mm -hmm. and hearing you say them, it, it feels much more visual. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what, how to, you know, what the hell that is, but <laughs> that's just kind of how it struck me. And I find that to be um, pretty powerful, actually. Yeah, I, I kind of write in the way that I speak in a way, like when I when I'm editing a poem, I read it out loud again and again, and the rhythm of it, you know, tends to uh, work with how I speak. Right. So, yeah. So that's part of it, I think. Um, that's I write, uh, that's yeah. one of my biggest downfalls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still editing stuff from 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me. You know, one of the other things that really intrigues me that I, I wasn't aware of at all before, but, you know, I keep running across and doing a little research and talking to you, you know, about this cataloging, cataloging books. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I'm clear if that's a job or a hobby or both. Right. And how that became. Um, because yeah, well. Dude, it makes me jealous, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, yeah, no, it's, it's, I kind of fell into what I'm doing now. Um, basically, like most of my working life, you know, I work in little independent record stores and bookstores and stuff. And, um, you know, living here in San Francisco, once, you know, the rents really started going up, all the little bookstores and all the little music stores, yeah, you know, it started yeah. closing down. So, you know, I was I was becoming obsolete, you know, just hopping from job to job. Once my little bookstore would close down, I get a job right. another little bookstore, that closed down, I get a job at a record store, that closed down. But um eventually I ended up where I am now, which um I'm working at an auction house that specializes in rare books. And I'm a cataloger for them. I'm kind of in charge now of their uh literature themed auctions also counterculture and such beats bukowski right. and um so i kind of curate these auctions for them and it's 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 great because i get to see a lot of amazing stuff yeah you know and it, it's, it's also very fast paced and there's always deadlines so i don't really get to enjoy this stuff as much as i'd like to you have to kind of you know catalog it throw it aside and go on to the next thing you know and 
Right. In a way, it almost, you know, it's great, but then at the same time, it kind of makes you kind of jaded in a way. Like, I don't, things aren't quite as special anymore sometimes when you work at it. Because, like, oh, here's another copy of this. Here's another first edition of Hemingway. Here's another first edition of, you know, Catcher in the Rye, blah, blah. You know, it's like, it, it kind of becomes Or common. William Taylor got a <laughs> first edition. But no, I, you know, the, the funnest part is when you get, get to deal with unique stuff like, uh, unique letters poetry manuscripts like really yeah. cool stuff that's really exciting still um, I, I love some of the old even as far back on any kind of book really anything with a leather leather cover that's been decorated in some way mm -hmm. is, is a masterpiece to me i don't care what's in it <laughs> <laughs> no sure yeah no i love uh just nicely bound books. i have a secret vision of of one day doing a hand stitch book um, because I do a lot of art that matches the poems I'm writing intentionally. Right. Um, I, I think it's cool. Uh, I think it's really, yeah. really cool. And I would love to have my hands in that. But I do understand the fast pace of a different position. And right. I know how that could be hectic, even though, I mean, I made thousands and thousands of dollars some days, you know, doing sales. And it was something that, you know, I can't do it now, but I don't want to do it now. But <laughs> the thing is, it's, you know, to do that job for any money would be fine, you know. <laughs> right. No, I mean, I can't. Really I don't complain. have to hate myself, you know. <laughs> right. No, I certainly can't complain about my job because, you know, I, you know, I'm a college dropout. I don't have a degree, you know, so I'm I'm actually getting to do something really exciting, you know. Oh, uh, you just don't know I'm angling you for a good deal on a book sometime. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll tell you something I'm looking for. So if you right. think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's super cool. Um, no, it, it is cool. It's it's exciting. It's still exciting when you get to deal with them. I, you know, what gets me, I think it's the vision of all of it together. Yeah. You know, even though it's transitory or whatever. Yeah. It feels like just the energy of, how many people have read those words and the yeah. ways that they impacted them? And you, you get to learn a lot about a lot, of, learn a little about a lot of different things. Did you post you know. about a book recently? Yeah, I post whatever. I come, come across something really interesting, I post about it. Um, but recently I was getting to do um, some of Gregory Corso's letters and that manuscripts. Was it. That was it. Yeah, and that was really fun. Um, I bet. Yeah, I actually had a typescript of his poem, The Bomb, like his original, you know, typescript of it. Um, and some of his letters, you know, some Ferlinghetti letter. Yeah, some really neat stuff. So it's really fun. Um, and you get to meet like a lot of interesting people, too, you know, yeah. uh, related. You know, there's always some old girlfriend of Henry Miller, you know, calls us up and she wants <laughs> to see all her letters at Henry Miller Center, you know, and um, yeah. So, just you, you, yeah, it's it's an interesting job. And it's wow. <laughs> letters henry miller center i bet you get a lot of those <laughs> no it, it's actually really <laughs> um no there's there's this woman recently who um, had a collection of letters at henry miller center when he was very old she was pretty young you know and the letters are actually kind of funny you know you, you actually kind of see what a kind of <laughs> lecherous old what, man, what a mad man you know he'd was. be writing these letters like well, yeah, I'll meet you as long as you're not too ugly. Make sure to send me some pictures, you know, kind of thing, you know. And this is when he was like 90 years old. And, you know, yeah, I so. can only imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. I mean, uh, you know, assuming stuff is original and it's actually for real, you could learn a lot of cool shit. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's very educational. It's very educational. You know, it's like sitting down with Richard Mariano is one of my like bucket list things to do just because the people he knows, the experiences he's had, you know, and he's a hell of a good, nice guy to begin with. So shit, I'd want to do that anyway. <laughs> right. But um, but no, it's, it's a great job. Yeah, cool. Well, let's get back to the old. You want to read another old one before we start talking about the book? Sure, maybe one more old one. Or... Kind of fun. I haven't read these in a while. Let's see. How about two?
All right, one more question. <clears throat> she had been beautiful once, and we sat at the bar drinking Bloody Marys on a listless August afternoon. Her movements lacked the grace they once possessed, and something was missing from her smile. She wore her 26 years like a coat she had since grown tired of. She had green eyes, honest laughter, and a firm belief in nothing much at all. And I understood her more than I understood most people. She exhaled long and slow when we both watched the smoke snake about the air in front of us. And she turned to me and said, God, Bill, what am I going to do with myself? It was three o'clock on a Monday afternoon. And here was one more question I didn't have an answer for. Yes, sir. Do you remember where that one came from? Yeah, that was when I was living in Santa Cruz. Uh, before I moved to San Francisco, I lived in Santa Cruz, California for 10 years, a little college hippie town. And um, yeah, you... a lot of those poems just came from hanging out at a few bars there and talking with friends and yeah. Were you, would you say you were under the influence of any particular writer at that point? Um, I was probably definitely a big Bukowski phase, you know. I was reading a lot of Bukowski, yes, you know. I knew it. I'm gonna tell you well, why. Of course, yeah. I, well, I mean, and and I wanted you to say it because sure. people either love that or they hate it. Sure. And I it's because I knew it was an older poem, and that first line, I forget what it is, but I right. remembered that line from somewhere, <laughs> like I had read it or at some uh -huh. point. And I remember, well, and then when you read it just now, I paid attention to your voice as well as the story. It had that same visual mm. appeal, but there were mm. certain words like um, the word smile at the end of the story. Mm. Your voice turned to fucking Bukowski, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, he, uh, yeah, definitely a big influence, you know, and I was reading a lot of Bukowski at the time, for sure. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's so funny though, and it, and I, it it's also somewhat rewarding that other people think that way, you know. Right. Yeah. I get I get hooked on people like I, Kenneth Patch, and I'm on him now, you know. Right, yeah, no, I love right Patch. Yeah. Now, and, yeah. and trying to catch up with all the people I were waiting for a podcast so I can read their books, but right. Uh, no, yeah, definitely the stuff, this stuff, you know, was, was writing in my uh, mid, late 20s, early I don't 30s. think I would say, and maybe we'll hear, but um, anything I know about the new book is doesn't have any book Bukowski showing. It, right. You know what I'm saying? It's like we evolve as writers, and I think... Right. Uh, I, I, I got turned up by Bukowski because my dad had Bukowski novels on his bookshelf. Uh huh. And I just like to read. Sure. And so when I started getting interested in it and chasing my own words, I, that was the first place I went, you know? And, right. You know, that's how I wrote and talked and whatever. Right. Well, you know, like as you said, like uh, Bukowski, you know, there's people who worship him and the people who despise him, you know, and I'm kind of more in the middle at his best. I, you know, I think he was an amazing writer. Right. Um, also wrote a lot of crap. And once he got famous, his publisher, Black Sparrow Press, they would just publish anything he wrote because it would make money. And yeah. so there wasn't a lot of editing going on. He would just write this shit, send it to Black Sparrow Press. They'd put it in a book and publish it, you know. So, yeah, there was a lot of subpar stuff. Exactly. That he was putting out, but at his best, see, I don't. I mean, I can't think of anything I've ever read that I would call subpar because I'm right. comparing him to him, you know. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. I guess in a Bukowski scale, it's like how drunk is he right. <laughs> at this point in his life or this particular right, time, right. Know? Like the video of him on stage just slaughtered, sitting at a library table talking to an audience and just yeah. You know, Heck, you know, it's like okay, well, you kind of deserve that at that reputation. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's uh, 
the reading that he did at City Lights, I think, like in late '60s, and there's video footage of it, audio footage, and you can hear him um, actually puking in a garbage can, like the second before he walks on stage. You hear this, you know, and then he walks on stage, like one second later, he picks up his beer. <laughs> yeah, like classic. On my uh, on the social yet distanced, um, like Patreon page, right? So you can support us. Um, my tagline on there, hey, it, it's cheaper, you know, for a month than it would be taking Bukowski out for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the new book. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us, I mean, you've you've transmitted, you've transgressed. What, what the hell is the word? You've moved <laughs> along through several <laughs> different publishers. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, gotten some books out there. So talk about those as much as you like, but I know that main event is we want to talk about the one that's coming or that's here at the panel right. when you're listening. <laughs> uh, no, no, I've, I've worked with a lot of great publishers. Um, Epic Rights, uh, Wolf Cartson's out of Canada. He did a lot of great stuff with me. He published my one uh, collection of stories um, that is still available. Um I'm totally trying a blank on the title of it. Um, uh, the hell is my book of stories called? Um, An Age of Monsters. Ah, uh, you know, and I'm still happy with that. That's my one collection of stories. I'm slowly working on another one, but um, uh, I've also worked with Sunny Outside Press out of Buffalo. Um, oh, I remember them. I bought some books from them. Yeah, David McNamara. Um, uh -huh. he does Sunny Outside. I think he's still doing. I want to say. Did Rebecca Shumada have books there once upon a time? Probably, yeah. I think yeah. that's where I bought her. One, yeah. One of her yeah, books. Likely, books yeah. From it's yeah. Quiet. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in my uh, current book um, coming up, A Room Above a Convenience Store, that's uh, with Michelle McDonald's press, uh, Roadside Press. And um, yeah, I had the book kind of done and I was wondering who I should uh, think about publishing it with. And I saw that Michelle was. Uh, accepting looking at manuscripts for books and i sent it her way and she liked it and uh so yeah it seemed to be a good pairing um, yeah i, I definitely i definitely love michelle and everything she does and she is um no frills bs about getting the job done and uh, right exactly like yeah um yeah she's great to work with and and the book looks beautiful and yeah so i'm excited about it yeah, well, good. I think that's it's a very exciting thing. Um, and I, I really do look forward to sitting down and reading it. Um, I think you should read some as much All as right. you're comfortable as much as you're comfortable reading. If 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 it if you need a break, we can chat in between. <laughs> sure. Oh, or I'll read maybe a handful and then yeah, maybe that's fine. you can chat a bit. Um yeah, I really we we want people to buy this book because I yeah. know what you're in for. So give it a yeah. give it what you got. All right. Uh, this is called All the True Poems of the World. The dark struts around like, like it owns the joints and all the places we used to hide or shuddered or filled with the useless faces of average men. I don't know where the lost and the broken congregate these days. So I skim along the busted earth, the ghost among ghosts. In these days without stories, these nights without dreams. And all the true poems of the world have been disappeared. I heard the jackboots on the doors and the terrible silence. We find a few now and then, haphazard in shallow graves. But most you never hear from. I imagine they're out there, fragile shades, frightened as they drift, listless in the void, waiting for someone to call them home. Nice. This is called, And Who Among Us? We sing our broken songs, all of us here abandoned in the trash heap of the 21st century, adrift in the algorithms, God's lonely fire in our veins. Caught like flies between the last playoff game and the next celebrity death. 
And the cardboard reality of each tired afternoon is a secret we're too afraid to tell. We toss the days aside like unwelcome gifts, imagining we are hungry for something other than what we've known. And what is left alive in this city but the ghosts? What music, what poetry, what unnamed thing to call our own? What blood is left in the sun? And who among us remembers how to burn? Beautiful, beautiful. I like that one. Thank you. Uh, this is called April Again, and I Don't Know. It's April again, and I don't know about it being crueler than any other month. But the terror of things is certainly in full swing. And despite it being the 21st century, and despite the advances of science and civilization and the rest of it, on any given day, you'll still see bloated bodies tossed into shallow graves like the garbage they are, as rusted tanks trungle through whatever's left of somebody's hometown. Just like it were 1943 or 1912 or 1972. And I'm not trying to get political, I'm just thinking out loud, putting down the obvious in my ragged little book like always, because it still seems to help a bit when nothing else does on a Tuesday afternoon in April, when I'm tired of work and life and love and death and everything else they're selling on those big screen televisions above the bar very nice and maybe i'll read one more and then uh, we can do whatever this is called whatever's left of the sun kid it's like i told you they're never going to give you anything back the days and the hours and everything they dreamed are lost to the ages and they're just going to keep taking and taking as if it were their birthrights as if it were your fate to say please and thank you until time collapses in upon itself. These lackeys of the dark, they are the opposite of poetry, the death of music. Kid, you got to take whatever's left of the sun, wrap it in your arms like you own the thing. Plunge your fist into the heart of it. Remember the language of fire and sing. So those are a few new ones from, from the book. Uh, a Room Above a Convenience Store is the name. I don't know if we mentioned the name of it. Yeah, um, we did mention it. And I'm, mm. you know, I, as always, Bill, the, the work is just stellar. Um, I want to do what I originally was going to do um, and and give, give the viewers a little bit of a taste of what those who have been fortunate enough to see this book um, I have to say about it. So let me take a minute and read yeah. this. Um, sure. I, if you don't mind, I'm going to go pee real quick while you're doing that. <laughs> hey, you do that. I, I'll talk okay. bad about you while you're gone. And then I'll Thank read this bio. Okay, guys, this is a review uh, or a bio that came along with uh, research. It says the poems of a room above a convenience store are raw, honest, and in a raw and honest with William Taylor's clear-eyed vision, the beauty and the terror of these plague times we find ourselves shuffling through. Taylor captures the loneliness and the suffering of this crazy broken world of ours, the fire and the fear that surrounds us. But his poems also point to the horizon at what might be a small shard of hope. Yeah, there is an endless ocean of loss. Yeah, we are haunted by the ghosts of our memories. Yeah, we fail and we fall, and we fail and we fall. But these poems tell us that there are still sometimes pretty things, moments of beauty and grace, quick gifts of light, shining despite the darkness, if only we keep looking for them. Taylor tells us that if there's something like joy to be found in the music of things around us, as long as we keep listening for something that sings. And that came from Scott Silsby, author of Meet Me Where We Survive. And I personally think it's a, 
a very nice uh, description of most all of Bill's work. Um, but in this particular case, I'm quite certain that um, I will get to know that feeling much, much better here in the near future. <laughs> Which uh, brings me back to the book, Bill. What what are the plans for the release and where can folks pre-order and buy it and all that stuff? Um, right. Uh, the official release date, I believe, is uh, May 19th. Um, right now, you can reserve um, signed copies uh, through, uh, I believe it's the Magical Jeep Distribution uh, website. Yeah, I will, I'll go and cut the links and put them in the description for all this. Yeah. Um, and I have, if you go to like my Facebook or my Twitter, I'll, I'll have links there. Um, but yeah, um, it's at the Magical Jeep uh, distribution page and you can reserve signed copies right now. Um, when it does come out, I'm planning um, to do, you know, some readings here in San Francisco and the Bay Area. And um, oh, you're not coming to Central Florida. <laughs> probably not. No. <laughs> well, that would be me and you having a cocktail somewhere, and I don't drink, buddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll go anywhere. Um, you know. <laughs> uh, not kidding. I'm working on a deal with a, a place up the street that does open mics all the time, and oh, well. the claim to fame is the Drag Brunch. Um, ah, right, yeah, yeah. It's that kind of place, and uh, right. And I mean, it's not a, it's a drag place. It's that's just what they do on Sunday mornings. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They, yeah. They, they might play rock and roll or have an open mic. You know. Right. Now, those are my favorite uh, readings to do, just in quirky places, bars. I think a reading to a bunch of drag queens at you know, yeah, at twelve noon would be awesome. <laughs> right. No, I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. I'm not going to keep too much more of your time. Uh, um, can you hang on while I tell everybody bye? Sure. Okay, we'll do that when I'll stop recording. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks. I hope to edit all this out and have it posted real quick. You'll know when you're reading this or hearing it mm -hmm. or seeing it. Um, in the meanwhile, we'll be talking about it. I uh, would encourage you highly to please go and look for William Taylor Jr.'s work anywhere you can find it. I'll include as many links as I can find um, where you can get to it directly and uh, hope to have it po uh, posted and on YouTube by, uh, let's say, Monday. And uh, that's this week, actually. Uh, so um, I, I, I do have to do a little editing and, and put my logo on it. So <laughs> um, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for coming and hanging out with us. We appreciate you coming. Please come back, like, subscribe, share, tell all your friends, tell all your enemies. Um, turn on your the YouTube page, please. Um, whether you're home or not, turn the volume down. Let that sucker play, man. I need some views. And subscribe. I don't care if you ever come back. Just subscribe, man. I need people so I can get paid. Thanks. Love you guys. See you next time. Uh, this is called April again, and I don't know. It's April again, and I don't know about it being crueler than any other month. But the terror of things is certainly in full swing. And despite it being the 21st century, and despite the advances of science and civilization and the rest of it, on any given day, you'll still see bloated bodies tossed into shallow graves like the garbage they are, as rusted tanks trungle through whatever's left of somebody's hometown, just like it were 1943 or 1912 or 1972. And I'm not trying to get political, I'm just thinking out loud, putting down the obvious in my ragged little book like always, because it still seems to help a bit when nothing else does on a Tuesday afternoon in April, when I'm tired of work and life and love and death, 
and everything else they're selling on those big screen televisions above the bar. Very nice. 